On now to uh, Jia Zhu, who's going to talk about basic interpretation of CT scans of the brain. Now, must point out that this was something that uh, that flummoxed me for quite a long time as a uh, as a, a junior resident. So um, I think getting a system for interpreta- interpreting CT scans of the brain and practicing it is uh, is is most important. So I'm looking forward to this. I might learn something. All right, thank you very much, Timing. Thanks, uh, Prof. Kate. So, good evening from Singapore. I'm Jia Shi, one of the senior residents from NNI. And uh, it's my pleasure today to present on the basic interpretation of the CT brain. So, these are the topics I'll be covering today. So, I think similar to, to Prof. Kate, you know, when I first started reading scans, um, it's not a very easy process at all. I made many mistakes, and I find that it's primarily, primarily due to um, me liking to overcomplicate things and focusing on things that are irrelevant. So thankfully after, you know, quite a few, um, quite a few years of um, guidance from seniors from reading, I've learned some tips and tricks. So hopefully they'll be useful for you as well. Um, because of time constraints. So I'll just fo- be mainly focusing on uh, reading CT brain, plain CT brains, and I'll be focusing on trauma and acute neurosurgery. So before we start talking about the CD brain itself, let's figure out where in the decision-making process um, the CD brain features in, because what questions we ask ultimately determines what answers we get. When we first see a patient, we take a history, we perform an examination, we do some investigation, and it brings us to the impression that we have. And from that impression um, of what a patient may have, we derive a plan. So since we're all surgeons, the question we always ask is, is there any indication for surgery? Is there any contraindication to surgery? And if so, can I optimize it? Um, is there any urgency to perform the surgery? And how can I approach um, this operation? So obviously investigations, um, the scan is an investigation. With regards to indication for surgery, the scan can tell us whether or not there's a surgical lesion to take out. With regards to urgency, the severity of mass effect that is demonstrated on the CD brain, along with the patient's clinical status gives us a very, very strong clue. And of course, with regards to approach, so for example, when we see um, intracerebral hematoma, we can, the scan can give us some idea of should we approach it from a transcortical or trans approach, or perhaps even if uh, something, something simple like it's a subdural um, clot evacuable safely through only a burrow. So all these questions converge onto the CT brain. So let's talk about normal because everything that's not normal is is pathological. So it's very, very important that we recognize normal. So as mentioned before, I I tend to like to overcomplicate things. So hopefully at the end of this talk, we can uh, simplify everything and, uh, and have a more concise and precise thought process. So these are some of the normal structures that we'll go through today. Let's start with the lobar anatomy. So to figure out exactly which part of the cerebral cortex we are on, we need to know exactly where is the central sulcus. Now, there are many ways to figure out where we are exactly. I'll just take two of the more common and my favorite ways to identify the central sulcus and share it with you guys. Now, this is an axial CT scan. This is corresponding to uh, a rather high cut on the sagittal scan um, beside it, okay? So we can recognize this superior frontal sulcus over here. And we know this is the case because it's in the anterior portion of the, of the axial cut. It is um, parallel to the interhemispheric fissure. And of course, it is right lateral to the superior frontal gyrus. So we have the superior frontal sulcus over here. The south side that is just posterior to it in continuity, this is the pre-central sulcus. And of course, we have the central sulcus immediately adjacent to it. So the question comes, what if there is a lesion in the frontal lobe distorting the entire anatomy? So there are two main ways that I like to do it. Firstly, we can look at the contralateral frontal lobe to give us a clue. And another way we can can, uh, go about doing this is by looking for the intraparietal sulcus. So this intraparietal sulcus, we know that this is it because it's in a posterior part of the axial cut. It is in oblique orientation compared to the interhemispheric fissure. This brings us to the post-central sulcus and of course, what's anterior to it will be the central sulcus. Now, after we identify the central sulcus, we know for a fact this is the pre-central gyrus. 
and that is because there is the hand knob over here and this corresponds to the contralateral innervation of the motor function of the hand let's talk about the subcortical region okay we see this structure over here this is the head of the cordate we know this because it is just lateral to the frontal horns of the lateral ventricle next we can identify the thalamus the thalamus is the superior aspect of the lateral wall of the third ventricle which is just seen over here okay and we can see the internal capsule right over here okay we have the anterior limb of the internal capsule we have the genu over here which is just lateral to the former of Monroe and we have the posterior limb of the internal capsule and just lateral to it we have the lentiform nucleus moving on to the brain step now there are three parts we have the midbrain pons and medulla right so we can identify the Mickey Mouse shape appearance over here. So M for Mickey Mouse, M for midbrain. Hence, this represents the midbrain. The pons is attached to the cerebellar hemispheres through the peduncles. All right, you can see the two peduncles over here. Hence, we can identify the pons. And lastly, we have the medulla. All right, we can see the forma of Lushka exiting laterally, the Magandhi in the midline. And that gives us the medulla. So very quickly about the ventricles, right? There are two lateral ventricles, one on the left, one on the right. We have anterior here, we have posterior over here. Now the Monroe, whatever is anterior to the Monroe, we have the frontal horns. Um, sorry, anterior to the Monroe is the frontal horns, posterior to the Monroe is the body of the lateral ventricle. This leads us into the atrium, which is in continuity with both um, with the Monroe, uh, with the body, the occipital, as well as the temporal horns. Okay, so both lateral ventricle filters into the third ventricle by the former Monroe, and that brings us to the fourth ventricle over here through the aqueduct of Silvius. So let's translate this to the axial CT scan. Right over here, we have the frontal horns. Okay, we have the atrium. We have the temporal horns over here. And of course, we have the former of Monroe. Now, before we move on to the third ventricle, it is very important to know how the normal ventricular anatomy looks like on an axial CT scan. So if you can focus on the frontal horns, you can notice that it actually looks rather like a deflated balloon, right? It has a concave shape. And anything that, that deviates from this, you should be very suspicious of hydrocephalus developing, right? So once the concave shape starts to round and balloon outwards, that is a, um, an early sign. The temporal horns as well is generally slit-like and not easily seen. So unlike this, this schematic you have over here. So once this temporal horn gets more and more prominent, that's another red flag as well. Now over here, we have a slit-like midline structure. And this is the third ventricle. And of course, we have the sylvius and the fourth ventricle over here. Now finally, for normal anatomy, we can talk about the systems. Now, of course, there are many, many systems that we can, we can talk about all day, um, but I'll just zoom in on the key important systems that we should all know about. Now, right over here is the interpeduncular systems sitting just between both cerebral peduncles of the midbrain. We have the crural system and the ambient system over here. In the posterior fossa, we have the cerebral pontine angle systems. And very, very important as well is the cisterna magna. So we have talked about normal. Let's touch a bit about abnormal, right? So um, it is very tempting to just read scans purely based on pattern recognition. Um, but I, I do find that that tends to uh, make me miss things. So I would recommend a system to be comprehensive and just very similar to how we read ECGs and chest X-rays. You know, there is a system that we can apply to CT grades. So personally, I like to use the ABCs of scan reading, A for asymmetry, B for the blood and brain, C for CSF spaces, and S for skull and scalp. So I'll read the scan multiple times, a very, very quick general screen, just purely looking for any asymmetry. Then when I look at the scan in detail, I'll look specifically for the B, C, as well as the S. Now, this scan here, let's just look at it from a very, very broad perspective. I think it's very, very clear to all of us that there is asymmetry, 
the right side of the brain and left side of the brain are clearly different. There is a large precentric lesion compressing on the brain, leading to shift of the midline, effacement of the ventricles over here, and some of the south side angina that's prominent that is still present on the contralateral side is not seen over here. There is clear asymmetry. When we talk about blood in the scan, we talk about acute, subacute, and chronic blood. The more acute blood is hyperdense or bright. That's with respect to the adjacent cortex. Uh, subacute blood, which is generally after three days old, will be more isodense, which is similar in color to the adjacent cortex. And we touch about we talk about chronic blood that's beyond two to three weeks, and that's generally hypodense or dark compared to the adjacent cortex. So right here we have blood in multiple compartments. We have blood that is lenticular in shape, lens shape here, and that is blood in the extradural space, extradural hematoma. We have blood in the in a crescentric uh, shape, and that is a large, uh, rather a moderately sized um, subdural hematoma. There is blood here in the parenchyma, intracerebral hematoma. Of course, blood in the cystins, subcranial hemorrhage, blood in the ventricles, intraventricular hemorrhage. Uh, not to forget as well, there's intracranial compartment, there's also the extracranial compartment. So there's this large scalp hematoma that we should not be missing. When we talk about the brain, sometimes we can see a very, very clear asymmetry in the appearance. Now for this axial cut, over here, we can see a large hypodense um, lesion encompassing the territory of the middle cerebral artery. This spares the anterior and posterior cerebral artery territories. Um, you can see the south side and gyre on the contralateral side are still nice and open. However, ipsilaterally, they are effaced. Um, of note, the ventricles on the ipsilateral side are still wide open. So this is uh, middle cerebral. Uh, MCA infarct with mild to moderate mass effect. And you can see over here the culprit lesion. We have a dense MCA sign representing uh, thrombus in the proximal M1. Now we talked about ventricles earlier. Now if you can zoom in on the middle axial cut over here, you can see that the, the normally concave frontal horns of the lateral ventricle has actually started to balloon outwards. Okay. And this is because of the extra CSF that's accumulated within the lateral ventricles. Likewise, the temporal horns that are initially slit-like have become very prominent. Third ventricles, it's now rounded, it's not supposed to be like this, okay? Also a very important clue will be these hypodense, hypodensities that is just adjacent to the frontal horns. And that represents transepidermal shift for, of CSF um, that's pushed out the ventricles into the parenchyma representing acute hydrocephalus. Now, the cystins are very useful, uh, are a very useful marker in a CT scan because the cystins actually um, mark the boundaries between uh, compartments of the brain, which means if there is cystinal effacement, there is likely to be some form of herniation syndrome happening. Now, if you look at this normal scan over here, you can appreciate around the midbrain, the basal cystins being wide open. However, on this image over here, the interpeduncular bilateral crural cystins, as well as the ambient on the contralateral side, is all effaced. Why is this the case? You can see, I'm sure you can appreciate the uncus um, of the right temporal lobe herniating and compressing on the midbrain. And this is secondary to a large precentric lesion um, on the right side. We talk about the skull next. We can see a large extradural hematoma. And that is, if you switch on to the bone window, we can see that this is actually secondary to this displaced skull fracture over here. Now, finally, we talk about the scalp as well. We can see a scalp hematoma here, a scalp hematoma here. And that's about it. So two very quick tips in addition to being comprehensive is to play with the windowing um, of the CT scan. When we are looking at scans, we generally only see the brain window and the bone window. So if you look at this brain window over here, I think most of us can appreciate that there's some asymmetry, but it's not so easy to figure out what exactly is happening. However, if you look at the subdural window, we can see that there is a thin layer of acute subdural hematoma. So this is not seen in the brain window because um, in the acute phase, sometimes blood 
can appear to be um, of similar density to the adjacent skull. So we can use a sub window to differentiate the blood and the bone. Another quick tip is if you forget everything, at the, at the very least, remember how to, how to look for mass effect. So let's start with uh, midline shift. So this is what the radiologists love to, love to um, report. So let's figure out what exactly what it is. So we can see here the midline of the skull. You can find this when you draw a line from the crystal gali to the union. So this is the midline of the skull. Over here at the cut, where you can see the formula of Monroe, we can use the septum pellucidum as the midline of the brain. And the distance in between will be the midline shift. If you go on to the scan to the right, okay, we can talk about effacement of a few things. Effacement of the south side, which is still prominent on the contralateral side, and effacement of the lateral ventricles with the frontal horn and the atrium occipital horns being effaced. Finally, we talk about if, um, herniation syndromes. Uncle herniation, as mentioned previously. And if you look at this scan on the left, this is the cisternal magna. You can all appreciate these two ovoid structures here. They're not supposed to be present. These two are the cerebellar tonsils, and they have descended due to raised intracranial pressure in the posterior fossa, tonsillar herniation compressing on the medulla. So let's just go through a few real life examples to apply some of the lessons that we have learned. Um, before that, so um, very often when, when we are called, when neurosurgeons are called for to see a patient, the scan has already been performed. And personally what I like to do when I see a scan is I like to try to predict the patient's neurological status. And I find that it's very useful because um, not only it, it helps me in understanding the, the functional and the radiological neuroanatomy better, but that is also very important because I find that if I have an idea of how the patient might be doing as I am um, going towards the patient, either in the emergency department or in the ward, in my mind, I'm already formulating a plan. Okay, and when I see a patient, I'm just trying to confirm the patient's neurological status and executing my plan. So there's no way to escape. You are the surgeon and you are the radiologist at the same time. Okay, so let's just go through a few scans. This is a scan of a middle-aged gentleman with um, uncontrolled uncontrol hypertension. So the patient presented with acute right-sided weakness. All right, so if your answer for this scan is, you can see a left-sided thalamic lesion. You know this is thalamus because we can identify the third ventricle, and this is the lateral wall. There's a small-sized thalamic intracerebral hematoma with probably mild mass effect. You can see the ipsilateral south side and gyri is still wide open. Now, this intracerebral hematoma has actually dissected into the ventricles, as you can see. And if you look down at the temporal horns, you can see some early prominence suggestive of hydrocephalus. All right, so let's move on to the next scan. Um, we have a patient who presented with acute headache and vertigo with rapidly um, decreased, rapidly worsening drowsiness. Okay, let's look at it one more time. All right, so if you look closely, we can all see a large intracerebral hematoma arising from the left side of the cerebral hemisphere that's causing severe mass effect in the posterior fossa. And we know this because the cerebellar pontine angle systems bilaterally are effaced, the fourth ventricle is effaced, and if you look down into the cisterna magna, you can see the tonsils herniating downwards. And of course, as expected, there are early signs of hydrocephalus. Um, this scan here belongs to an elderly lady with a history of multiple falls. She presented with another fall this time and she has, uh, she's on aspirin for ischemic heart disease. Okay, so I'm sure we can all appreciate this lady, this, this scan has um, 
um, generalized cortical atrophy from the prominent sulcus. Um, you might think that there may be some ventricular prominence over here. Um, however, if you compare um, the proportion of prominence against the sul sulcal uh, prominence, this is actually acceptable and it's more of a part of aging rather than a hydrocephalus. Now, if you bring the scan upwards, we can see a crescentric, a small crescentric lesion of left convexity. Um, and that's a subacute nature because of isodensity to the cortex and it's causing mild mass effect or well, actually no mass effect. Now, final scan of the day, patient with acute headache and uh, rapid drowsiness and right hemiplegia. This should be quite obvious to all of us by now. All right, we have a large intracerebral hematoma that's centered on the lentiform nucleus on the left side. This is causing um, massive, severe massive actually. You can see it extending all the way to the cortex over here. You can see the sulci and gyri, ipsilaterally being effaced. We can see the midline being pushed away. We can also see the blood dissecting into the ventricles. And of course, not to forget, the uncus is also compressing on the midbrain. Okay, so we've went through a lot today. We've talked about the purpose of a CT scan. We've talked about normal anatomy. We've talked about how we may find the central sulcus on the CT scan. We've talked about developing a system for not missing pathologies on the CT brain. And um, this is a very rapid review. So thank you very much for your attention. If there's any question I can help with, please, please ask. If not, um, you can email me. Thank you. Razu, that was, that was really great, but I'm gonna take you to task on one part of your presentation. So I, I completely understand that when you've got a trauma, you're on the way down to the ED, it's good to look at the scan on the way to, to, to be ready. But in general, for your neurosurgical practice, you will do well to look at the patient first and the scan second. And that's particularly, we're coming up to spinal surgery, particularly in spinal surgery where you've got the 65-year-old woman where everyone's got an abnormal scan and you need to work out what is the pathology that's important. But it's if you look at the scan first and the patient second, and I, but I'm not disagreeing with you for an emergency situation, but if you look at the scan first at the, and then the patient second, you really come with a confirmational bias of what you think is wrong with the patient. And that may not be the case at all. The patient with the narrow cervical spine but who ha actually has Parkinson's disease, for instance, or you know, a million, a million other reasons why it might not be the, 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 the diagnosis as based on the scan. So I'll let you do it when you're running to the ED, but not when you're seeing the patient in the clinic, okay? Of course, of course. <laughs> we, have a, uh, we have a question. Um, landmarks to use to measure displacement of the fourth ventricle for a posterior fossa extradural or cerebellar infarct? Must admit, I don't even know the answer to that question. I'm hoping that Dr. Rao might as well. <laughs> I think it's not so much landmarks, but knowing your normal anatomy and what gets distorted. So obviously uh, looking for Foreman of Lushka and Monjondi and looking at the distortion that way, uh, before looking at where the distortion happens anteriorly, prepontine systems, cerebral pontine angle systems. And, and the final one is basically upward or downward herniation. Right? So uh, I think when you consider the, the pathologies that happen in the posterior fossa, uh, you have to look at that sort of where is the effacement going to be. And we've got uh, a very wise comment from Dr. Al Dradi from, uh, from Yemen, uh, just reminding us that when the patient has a trauma, they may have other injuries that need to be uncovered by examination before you make a diagnosis and treatment plan. Uh, but thank you so much, Jazu, for that, that presentation. It was most comprehensive and, um, and incredibly useful. I might ask you to unshare your screen. Oh, wait a minute, I've got one more question.
do you think that only 2D axial images are sufficient or coronal and sagittal too are required? That, that's with regards to mass effect, to finding a lesion, what, what exactly in particular we're I talking? Think, uh, probably, probably in general terms, really. I mean... Yeah. I think that one is, uh, if you look at different hospitals in the world, uh, depending on the radiologists, uh, some of them are comfortable just reporting only on axial scans, and some would need two views, uh, usually an axial and coronal view. Uh, sagittal views, not routinely done, I would say most of the time, uh, but critical for you to reconstruct them based on the current CT methodology. So you can always ask for a reconstruction if you don't have that uh, view that is given. I'm, I must say in our National Neuroscience Institute, uh, our radiologists prefer only axial slices uh, in terms of loading it up and reporting it. Uh, but some of the other hospitals do uh, require an axial and coronal scan. Okay, thank you, everyone. I think we'll move on. Otherwise, we, we could be here discussing this all night. So thank you, Jazu. That was a great presentation. I have um, no I have no comment on lip I'm sorry? Can I, can I say a small comment on lip? Yes, yes, of course. Uh, thank you, Dr. Lim, for your very, very nice presentation. Uh, just only a small addition. For the acute lesions you are having, if you are seeing some hypodensities inside or around these uh, acute lesions, hyperdense lesions, we must predict that there is an active bleeding because hypodensity in such patients, especially when I know that the history of the patient is just acute by trauma or by bleeding, that there is an active bleeding in that patient, which if I saw a small hematoma, by example, I should predict that this hematoma is increasing in size by time and this patient will need either very, very close observation or repeat the CT scan in very short time. Thank you very much. Dr. Drummond, uh, your, no your note was excellent uh, regarding that he should see the patient first and then see the CT, CT, see the CT scan. But if you saw the CT scan and you saw the patient later on, I re-advise you to go back and see the CT scan again. Of course. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you, Dr.